Right, Barry, thank you very much. We're going to hand over to you now for your talk on um, Lepidoptera defence mechanisms. Okay, thanks very much, Kieran. Well, firstly, thank you to the Field Studies Council and British Entomological and Natural History Society for inviting me to give this talk. And it really comes on the back of this book, which, as Ian says, was published a year ago. Um, I, I co-authored it with Phil Sterling, and it's beautifully illustrated by Richard Lewington. And I must thank the British Entomological and Natural History Society for awarding us a Maitland Emmett research grant, which went towards digitalizing thousands of my color slides so that I could share them with Phil and Richard to help with the production of the book. So um, I could talk all day about, about um, defense mechanisms in Lepidoptera, but I haven't got all day. So I have to concentrate on certain aspects. And so we'll be dealing with defense mechanisms that work against predators that find their prey by visual means. And in fact, there'll be an occasional butterfly in the talk, mainly micro moths, uh, sorry, mainly macro moths, occasional micro moth. And it'll be especially on the caterpillars because after all the caterpillars really just have to eat and avoid being eaten. So whatever the pattern is, whatever they look like, is almost certainly something to do with defense. So I show a blue tit here because birds are terrific predators of Lepidoptera, especially their caterpillars. And it's estimated that blue tit chicks alone eat 50 billion caterpillars every year in Great Britain and Ireland. So there's a huge level of predation. And we mustn't forget that with every predator insect uh, interaction, that the stakes are in unequal really. So if the bird loses out, it loses a meal. If the moth or caterpillar or whatever loses out, it loses its life. And so I think all these factors put together over millions of years have resulted in the evolution of some quite extraordinary defense mechanisms, which is what we'll um, have a look at now. And the aspects I'm going to look at are crypsis, and then warning coloration or aposomatism, and then mimicry. And finally, we'll finish off with a twist to the tail. So, First of all, crypsis. So there's a moth on the picture here, which it might just take you a second or two to work out where it is. But this is a moth called the large ranunculus, and it's here, and it's just superbly cryptic on this lichen covered background. And then what about this? Um, so this is a caterpillar of the Brussels lace moth, which feeds on lichen. Kieran, do you want to um, put a poll up to see when people can see it? So you can move the you can move the box to the side of the screen to help you. Right, okay, so most people have worked out where it is, but just to show you, um, I think we can probably end the polling now. Um, for those who haven't worked it out, here's the head of the caterpillar here. And here's the body here, and it's coming back to the tail end here. So it's not small, but um, it's just quite difficult to see. And the amazing thing is that, you know, if this caterpillar happens to be on a different colored lichen, it blends in equally well. So here we are, here's another one, same species, on a different colored lichen. So here's the head end here. And uh, here's the body of the caterpillar here. And it's coming back to the tail end here now. So it's quite remarkable how it blends in. It would really be jolly difficult to spot. And then what about this? Can you see this one? I mean, this is a big caterpillar now. This is the red underwing moth, which feeds on the leaves of this willow tree at night. And then by day, it descends and hides itself at the base of the trunk. The amazing thing about this one is it's even aligning itself to the contours of the bark. So I'm sure you can see it, but here it is. And I tell you when I found it, it was just so difficult to see. 
And if we crop, crop the image a bit, there we are, crop it once more, and there's the lava in its full glory. So this is a really big caterpillar that was really, really difficult to see. And what about this? This is the um, caterpillar of a moth called the blotched emerald. So here's the head end here. The body comes all around here, and here's the rear end here. So the blotched emerald caterpillar has got these short spiky hairs to which it can attach bits of plant material. So the food plant is oak, and this one's attached bits of oak bud scale to its body, making it really remarkably difficult to see. Now in the same group, the Essex emerald, now extinct in this country, used to do the same with its food plant, sea wormwood. But, um, oh, there, there's a blotched emerald, absolutely beautiful moth, really lovely. Um, but I noticed that um, a couple of other of these, this group of moths, the emerald moths, do a similar thing, um, this time with algae. So this is the large emerald, and it's the instar that spends the winter in diapause. Okay, so it's here, you can see some silk strands on the birch twig here, and it's clinging on for the winter. But all this green, all this green on the body here is not markings, it's actually algae that are growing on the, on the skin. So I noticed this on an overwintering larva, and then in the spring, it sheds its skin, takes on a different appearance, and um, it carries on feeding on the birch leaves. And again, in the same group of moths, this is the common emerald now, which is, again is doing the same sort of thing. So you can see lots of green on the body here. And uh, these are, again, algae. And it's got a very, very rough skin. It's got thousands and thousands of little tiny projections which make the skin sticky. And you can see on the dorsum here, you can, you can see how rough it is. And in fact, to be honest, if, you, if we were sitting in a hall and I was giving this talk, you really wouldn't be able to see that level of detail from the back of the hall. So it's, it's certainly one advantage of these on online talks that you can, you can see that detail. So it's interesting that the, again, in this group of moths, the emerald, this, this species is adorning itself with algae, um, but only in the overwintering instar. So in the spring, it uh, sheds its skin, takes on a different appearance, and carries on feeding. So this is not one of the emerald moths now, this is the brimstone moth, which disguises itself as a, a sort of twig with various buds, or thorns or whatever coming off it. But this is an overwintering larva now, and uh, you can see it's got this greyish brown body colour, but also it's got these green patches um, rather resembling algae on a twig. But these are green patches. The skin is smooth. There are no algae on it at all. It's achieving the same trick as the uh, large emerald and the common emerald, but with a different mechanism. Okay, and um, caterpillars are the, st the commonest stage at which butterflies and moths spend the winter. And so the consequence is they're spending a huge amount of their lives in this stage and go through various seasons. And this is the early in star of a scarce silver lines caterpillar. And we'll see how it changes its appearance to cope with the different seasons. So here it is in late summer on the underneath of an oak leaf. So it's a green caterpillar on a green leaf. Then for the winter, it takes on this grayish brown appearance and it develops this saddle here which looks either like a leaf scar or a bud on the oak twig. Then when spring comes and it's time for the leaf, for the oak buds to, to open, it takes on this appearance. So we've got this opening oak bud here with the green leaf and flower showing through here and the, and the leaf scales and the bud scales rather here. And um, the caterpillar itself has taken on this green appearance, but got this reddish brown stripe along the side and another one along the dorsum, looking just like an opening oak bud. And then later in the summer, when the leaves are fully open, it takes on this green appearance. So it goes through these four stages, different appearances, 
to cope with the different seasons. And there is a scarce silver lines moth. Right. Can you see the moth? So this is a moth, a micro moth actually, although quite a large micro moth called Ypsilophe macronella, which is hiding very cryptically amongst a patch of dead Calamagrostis wood small reed. It's right in the middle of the picture. Okay, now I'll just crop the image and there it is. Okay, so here's the moth here. And it's just jolly difficult to see amongst the dead Calamagrostis. And everyone's favorite, the buff tip. I mean, isn't that extraordinary? It's a common moth and it comes to light traps very commonly, but I'm not sure I've ever just chanced upon one in the countryside. They're just hidden away remarkably well. And what an incredible disguise as a broken birch twig. So if we crop the image, you can see that there's this darker gray color here, just like the gray of the birch twig. And then there's the lighter gray here, just like the al the, the al sorry, the lichen that's growing on the birch twig. And the buff tip to the forewing and the head and the front of the thorax, just like the broken twig. And you notice on the edge of these buff bits, there's a sort of dark, light, dark appearance. Dark, light, dark. Well, it's just like the broken bark. It just goes dark, light, dark, you know, dark, light, dark. I mean, it's incredible how this thing has evolved over millions of years. And then it's quite a common thing for caterpillars to uh, resemble twigs, like we saw earlier with the brimstone moth. This one's called the September thorn, and it's got all these bubbles on it and these markings looking just like an oak twig when it's at rest. So you can see here that on the oak twig, there's a leaf scar here, which looks just like this mark here or that mark there. Then there's all these projections here looking rather like buds. And again here, it's just an incredible disguise really. And now, that, so that's the end of Crypsis really. And now we come on to warning coloration or apisomatism as it's known. So this is the all familiar cinnabar moth caterpillar, although sadly it's much, much less common than it used to be, feeding here upon its food plant ragwort. So it's sitting openly on its food plant by day. It's brightly colored and it's distasteful. So it's got toxins in there. So if a bird were to attempt to eat it, it would realize it was distasteful and learn to avoid them in the future. And in fact, it's probably part of a malarian mimicry complex. Malarian mimicry is where, the, is where more than one species takes on a similar appearance so that the birds have to take less of them to realize they're unpalatable. So it's unpalatable species evolving to look in a similar way so that the birds don't have to take as many. So it's part of a malarian mimicry complex with other yellow and black striped insects like wasps and uh, hornets and so on. And so the birds avoid them except one and that's the cuckoo and the cuckoo is remarkable really. It seems to be able to cope with these really toxic caterpillars. And in fact, the juvenile cuckoos, um, once they've left the nest and are no longer being fed by the host, this is their commonest prey item. Okay, so it's, this is warning coloration, and there's the adult as well, another warningly coloured insect. So the cinnabar moth flies by day, and uh, the warning coloration means the birds leave it alone. And uh, this is another unpleasant caterpillar for any predator. This is the brown tail moth, which li this lives communally in nests until the, the very last stages of its um, time as a caterpillar when they disperse a bit. But it's not these long hairs that cause the problem, it's the brown cushions on the back of the caterpillar. So these cushions contain small barbed hairs about half a millimetre in length. 
And it's variously quoted that each caterpillar has between half a million and two million caterpillars, uh, two million hairs on it rather. And they really are incredibly irritant. I mean, if you ever touch one, you just get such a horribly itchy rash. And yet the, um, yet the cuckoo can manage them. Extraordinary, really. So this is in the family, um, the subfamily Lemantrianae of the Erebidae. And here's another example in the same sub subfamily. This is the Vaporamoth, again, with very irritant hairs. But I want you to notice in particular these tufts coming out of the front here, the tufts on the dorsum and the tuft on the rear end. So very irritant, very unpleasant for any bird to attempt to, to eat it. But what about this? OK, so this is in a completely different family now. This is in the Noctuidae. It is a caterpillar of the nut tree tussock. And it's rather similar, isn't it? I mean, it's um, it's got these tufts coming up the front end, and tufts on the dorsum here, and a tuft on the rear end. So if we put them side by side, you can see how similar they are really, completely different families. So this is an example undoubtedly of Batesian mimicry. Batesian mimicry was in a, it was when a species that's fine to eat mimics a species that's unpalatable and thus gains protection. So in these particular examples, even the sort of coloration is, is similar. So uh, amazing, really. And then this is another family of moths whose caterpillars cause an irritant rash. This is the family Lassiocampidae. This is the drinker moth caterpillar. Again, causes a nasty rash. But again, the cuckoo can eat them. And in fact, this is the probably the main prey item cuckoos when they arrive in spring and early summer. Right, so what about this? This is a lobster moth caterpillar. So the, the lobster moth caterpillar comes out of the egg and it just eats its eggshell in the first instar. It won't eat any leaves and it has to eat the egg eggshell. So it eats the eggshell, then it sheds its skin, and this is the second instar now, which actually looks pretty much like the first instar. But this is probably an ant mimic, and it's probably, I think, an ant mimic at both ends of the body. You know, it's got these extraordinarily and unusually long true legs here. Then it's got these tails at this end of the body, and it really does look very ant-like. And interestingly, there is a caterpillar uh, much bigger than this in Malaysia, which mimics an ant at both ends of the body. So this is the young lobster moth caterpillar. And then when it's fully fed, that's what the lobster moth caterpillar looks like at rest. Extraordinarily bizarre sort of creature, really. But when disturbed, it splays out its long true legs and has this rather threatening appearance. And again, you can see it on your screen now, which you wouldn't be able to see at the back of the hall, a hall, is this gland here on the first thoracic segment, and that's said to be able to squirt out formic acid and acetic acid. So it's got some remarkable defense mechanisms, the lobster moth caterpillar. And in fact, there is one other as well, which I'm not going to tell you about now. We'll come on to that later in the talk. Right, Kieran, could you do a poll to see who saw that uh, caterpillar, that moth rather? So you should have a black screen at the moment, so don't worry that the screen's gone black. Did anybody see the moth in that picture? And, and I showed it to you just briefly because I wanted to make the point that you're all staring at this screen, but the birds are hopping around at high speed through the hedge, probably seeing things in dappled light and also seeing things partially obscured by other leaves and other bits of vegetation and so on. So most people didn't see that in the in the brief time I showed it. So we can, I think, finish the polling now and go back to the slide. OK, so um, the moth is there in the middle of the screen. Can you see it now? So this is a bird dropping mimic. These are all bird droppings here, but this in the middle here 
is actually a moth called the Chinese character. So we can crop the image to give you a better view. So here it is here. So it does look very, very like a bird dropping, doesn't it really? And in fact, bird dropping mimicry is quite widespread in the Lepidoptera and also in all sorts of other orders of insects and spiders and so on. So it's, it's clearly a popular thing to have evolved, but you have to be about the same size as a bird dropping to get away with it. So it's particularly um, pronounced in among a group of the moths in the family Tortricidae, which just happen to be about the right size. So um, if we have a look at the Chinese character now from the side, that's what it looks like side view. You were seeing it looking down on the top. So it's a pretty good bird dropping mimic really. But as I say, you have to be about the right size to get away with being a bird dropping. So here we are, here's another very, very good bird dropping mimic. This is a caterpillar of the older moth, either in its third or fourth instars, I can't quite remember, but it doesn't really matter. It's about the right size to get away with being a bird dropping and it's a remarkable mimic really. But the thing is the older moth is too big to get away with it when it's in its final instar. And so it then adopts a different defense. So just bear in mind, this is what it looks like. And then it's gonna shed its skin. Immediately, it looks like that. So it's exactly the same caterpillar, just completely changed its appearance after shedding the skin. So in this case, it's taken on the familiar black and yellow um, pattern of that malaria mimicry complex involving wasps and hornets and cinnabar moth caterpillars and so on. But this is Batesian mimicry again, for sure. So it's fascinating how this has evolved. It's got these weird paddle shaped hairs as well, which tend to break off quite easily. Very weird. Okay, and here's another very good Batesian mimic. This is the hornet moth. So the female, this is the female here, she's just hatched. And um, the wings here are covered with these little gray deciduous scales, which will fall off as soon as she flies. And here's the male come in and mated straight away. You can see his deciduous scales have fallen off. But I mean, this, this moth's about the same size as a hornet. It looks like a hornet. It's got clear wings like a hornet. It flies with a very, very fast wing beat like a hornet and even has a buzz as it flies. So it's just such a good Batesian mimic of a hornet. And in the same family of the clear wing moths, this is a smaller example. This is the yellow legged clear wing, which is mimicking some sort of species of wasp. Well, it may not be any particular species, actually, it's just that sort of black and yellow, I'm distasteful, I can hurt you sort of um, pattern. And then this is the narrow bordered bee hawk moth. So this one's just emerged from the pupa and it's dried its wings and all these light gray scales here are deciduous and they'll fall off as soon as it flies. So this is really a very good bumblebee mimic and possibly specifically the common carder bee, who knows? Um, but as soon as it flies, those, as I say, those deciduous scales fall off. And there's a mating pair there, and you can see how clear the wings are. It really is a jolly good bumblebee mimic. And of course, this is a day flying moth, as was the, um, the hornet moth, um, which is what you might expect from such a mimic. Now, I'm going to talk about snake mimicry. And uh, I've been developing some ideas about snake mimicry over a number of years. And then when it came to the book, I wanted to write something about it. And you can't really talk about snake mimicry without having this as the starting point. So clearly this is not a UK caterpillar. This is Hemeroplanes tryptolemus from the rainforest of Costa Rica. So when it's at rest, it's stretched out along the twig and it doesn't look much like a snake at all. But when it's disturbed, it lets go with its front pairs of prolegs, it twists its body over. So you're seeing at the front end, the underneath of the front end, and it puffs these segments out 
and shows off these eye spots. Now, I had I obviously need, wanted to get hold of this picture to, to be able to use. So I contacted Professor Daniel Jansen from the University of Pennsylvania, who's a world famous ecologist who's been working on the ecology of the rainforest of Costa Rica for many years. And he very kindly uh, sent me this image and allows me to use it for this purpose. So it is remarkable and I think there's a few points to make before we go further with the uh, with the snake mimicry idea. One is that the evidence for snake mimicry is circumstantial, as it is for bird dropping mimicry, to be honest. But uh, I, I think few of you, if anybody in the audience, would deny that that is a snake mimic. And it would be possible to design an experiment which hopefully would show that birds tend to avoid caterpillars with that sort of appearance. But it's impossible to design an experiment which shows that they avoid such a caterpillar because it looks like a snake. So from that point of view, the evidence is circumstantial as it is for the dropping mimicry. But I think it's reasonable to assume that that is using snake mimicry as its defense. Now, when it comes to um, cinnabar moth caterpillars and wasps and so on, the birds can try one or two or a few or however many it takes to learn to leave them alone. They learn that they're injurious and then leave them alone. But the same learning opportunities aren't available when it comes to snake mimicry. Because the first bird snake interaction is li likely to produce, um, is likely to prove fatal to the bird. And so the idea is that the fear of snakes is innate. In other words, the birds have a sort of hardwired image of a snake, probably a crude image of a snake in their brains. And it's just enough that when they see various visual cues, they just flee. So the birds, you know, as we've said, they're hopping around at high speed, they're getting partial views, possibly in dappled light, and they see something, and they've got to make a very instantaneous decision. Do I flee or is this something I could eat? And so the safe thing to do is flee. And so it seems that uh, this fear that's evolved is innate. And then another point I must make early on is that um, unlike bird dropping mimicry, where you have to be about the right size to get away with being a bird dropping mimic, with snake mimicry, size doesn't seem to be important. It's just those visual cues that, um, that seem to make the birds leave these things alone. So even this, which is a hawk moth caterpillar, I mean, it's, you know, it's quite a sizable caterpillar, but it's going to be smaller than snakes are. So Daniel Jansen sent me his paper on the topic of uh, snake mimicry. And I was really pleased, actually, because it did reinforce many of the ideas I'd had in my mind. But also he made some extra points which were really good, which just you know, simple enough, but it just hadn't occurred to me. So you can find the paper if you want to on the Internet, and I do recommend it. You can just put Daniel Janzen, J-A-N-Z-E-N, snake mimicry paper into Google and you come up with it. And there's all sorts of examples of snake mimicking caterpillars there, including some snake mimicking pupae. And, and some of the things he talks about in his paper must be quite small because they involve some microlepidopterous families. And the other thing is you can put into Google snake mimicking caterpillars and you come up with, again, all sorts from around the world. And it's, it's worth doing. They're quite remarkable, really. Um, of course, they're mainly from the tropics. Anyway, let's move on to uh, UK species now. So this is the elephant hawk moth, and it's long been regarded as a snake mimic. And you can see it's got some features which it shares with the Hemeroplanes dryptolemus. It's got this expanded anterior end here, and it's got these eye-like barks on the first abdominal, second abdominal segments, they taper down to the head end 
the fact that the head is here and the head and thoracic segments can be withdrawn within the abdominal segment um, if it's alarmed. So uh, yeah, I think that's a pretty good snake mimic. And then this is a friend's dog who happened to find, find an elephant hawk moth caterpillar when they were out walking and the, the dog was really perturbed by it. It was um, growling, scratching away at the ground, clearing vegetation, and it wouldn't touch the caterpillar at all. So it was clearly bothered by it. Right, and this is the small elephant hawk moth now. Again, pretty similar. It's got the eye patches in the same place, swollen anterior end, tapering down to the head. And this one's actually got this sort of rather reticulated snake-like pattern. And so traditionally, that's about as far as it's got with our uh, caterpillars, but I think we can take it much, much further than that. And remember, I said that size, I don't think, really matters when it comes to snake mimicry. Now, this is a pretty small caterpillar now. This is the rosy marbled moth. And, but it has similar features. It's got this swollen area on the first abdominal segment. And it's got these spots here. They're not as elaborate as on the elephant hawk moth. And then it's tapering down to the head end. But it seems that the smaller the caterpillar, there's just simply less surface area to allow for such an intricate pattern. But it's probably enough to, um, to put the birds off. So if we look at this sideways on, again, you can see that it's swollen in this plane as well, tapering down to the head. Right, so next one. So this is the dark spectacle now. And again, this one's got this very domed second abdominal segment. These yellow, bright yellow spots on the first abdominal segment tapering down to the head end. So again, it's a similar sort of arrangement with this swollen part tapering and these bright spots. And Let's have a look at more. Oh, there's a snake. I've thrown in a picture of a, of a snake. So you can see the, the shape of the, the snake's head. This one happens to have yellow spots here, but I don't think that really matters. I, they, they don't seem to be mimicking any particular snake. They're just, um, they're just sort of mimicking snakes in general. Right, and you might think I've gone completely mad at this stage. This is a caterpillar of the satin wave which isn't looking like a snake at all, but that isn't its usual resting posture. But I want you to notice here, this is the fifth abdominal segment here, and it's got these sort of flanges here, you know, um, so it's wider here than any of the other segments. So the normal resting posture is for the front end of the body to be curled up underneath the rear end. So if when, if when it's in that resting position, that's what it looks like. So these bright white or yellowish spots are then conspicuous on the fifth abdominal segment on these flanges and it tapers down to the rear end. So whatever's going on, it's the same essentially as the dark spectacle, but it's at the other end of the body. So I would argue that that in fact is a snake mimic. Now, what about that? So we haven't got any eye spots on this one, but we've got, oh, sorry, but we've got a fairly, um, we've got a fairly convincing snake head shape at the front of the body. So this is the caterpillar of the blood vein now. Again, it's like the previous species, it's a pretty small moth really, but um, there's definitely something going on there. It's an unusual shape. And I would say that that's pretty snake-like. And next, the ribboned wave. Now the ribboned wave has this grayish, dark grayish brown color here. And then at the rear of the body from the fifth abdominal segment back, it's pale. And the fifth abdominal segment has got these flanges here, making it wider. And on this pale bit is displayed this dark and conspicuous fork tongue marking. And the forks, extend into these flanges 
on the fifth abdominal segment. So it may just be that that marking is mimicking the forked tongue of a snake. Now, it's interesting actually, because these last three examples are mimicking snakes in very different ways. We've got the satin wave with its bright spots towards the rear end tapering down to the rear. We've got the blood vein with its expanded front end. We've got the ribbon wave, this forked tongue mark on the rear end. But they're all in the same subfamily, the sterinae of the geometridae. So it may be that there's something about the habits of this subfamily of moths, this group of moths, uh, whereby they're particularly liable to evolve snake mimicry. Right. Okay, so we've now got a swallowtail. This is the swallowtail butterfly, which occurs in this country just in the wetlands of East Anglia. Um, but actually, it's pretty common on the continent. And this, this photo I actually took in Greece. So this is a caterpillar of the swallowtail butterfly. Um, looks like it's probably warningly coloured, really, doesn't it, on its food plant. But if it's disturbed, then it shoots out this structure from the first thoracic segment called the osmaterium. And the osmaterium is said to give off an acrid smell. But I think also it's a pretty convincing fork tongue. So it may be that this caterpillar is also getting protection from snake mimicry. So can we think of a caterpillar that's using this sort of expanded section and a forked tongue combined? Well, yes, we can. And we're back now to our lobster moth. So this is the, looking at the, from the rear, the back of the lobster moth caterpillar. So we've got expanded bit here on the seventh abdominal segment, a very expanded eighth abdominal segment, and these modified anal claspers forming these tails, looking rather like a forked tongue. So there's another one there. So you've got this expanded bit here and the forked tongue appearance there. And I would say that looks jolly like a cobra, really. But you're going to say to me, there aren't any cobras here. So I'll say that doesn't matter because don't forget that many of our insectivorous birds spend a large part of their lives in the tropics where snakes are common. So our insectivorous birds, many of them go to tropical Africa. There are cobras there. There are even arboreal specialist bird eating snakes. So I think this is a really important point. Now, what about pupae? I said that Professor Jansen had a number of examples of pupae in Costa Rica that were mimicking snakes. Do we have any? Well, yes, but only one that I can think of, and that's this. So this is a most unusual sh usual shape for a pupa. This is the um, lilac beauty moth, and it's got this unusually expanded middle section here. It tapers down to the rear end, but it also tapers down to the head end where there are these eye spots here. So it's held on its honeysuckle leaf by these very flimsy cocoon, just a few strands of silk. So it's clearly exposed. So the, the pupa's been made somewhere where it's going to be exposed. And so there must be something about its appearance which is going to put the birds off. And I would say that that's a snake mimic. And it's very like some of the examples of snake mimicry amongst Daniel Jansen's pupae. So do have a look at his paper. Right, and then I'll finish off snake mimicry with this as an example. Now, you maybe feel I'm pushing it a bit here, but you know we said that whatever the appearance of a caterpillar, it's got to be something to do with defense. And this is a pretty small caterpillar now, this is the small fan foot. And it's got these prominent yellow spots here on this seventh abdominal segment. It doesn't particularly taper a lot to the, um, to the rear end, but you know, spots like this are, you know, they're quite widespread really. And it's just possible that that is enough to create in the bird a fear reaction and off they go. Right. So 
I'm just going to um, recap now with the main points and to make one or two more. So the evidence for snake mimicry is circumstantial. The bird's fear of snakes is innate and not learnt. They hop around quickly, getting brief, partially obscured views of larvae. They cannot afford to make a mistake. Size doesn't matter with regard to snake mimicry. And the smaller the larva, the less precise the mimicry, but it's probably as good as it can be. Snake mimicry readily evolves, and you've seen examples now from six different families of our Lepidoptera. Most examples are cryptic at a distance, but seen as snake-like at close quarters. Insectivorous birds migrate to the tropics where snakes are commoner. Now maintenance of this mimicry does not depend upon the model outnumbering the mimic. So with Batesian mimicry, you would expect the model to outnumber the mimic, otherwise the deceit would be uncovered. And finally, it's a low cost defense. So it doesn't involve the synthesis of expensive toxins or the growing of expensive irritant hairs. Right, now for the final twist in the tail, really. Um, this isn't the species I really want to talk about, but I'll just put it in just to orientate yourselves, really. This is the family of moths, the Psychidae, the bagworms, the family of micromoths. And this structure here is the larval case. And many of you will have seen this as you walk around the countryside. They're very, very common. And that's what it is, the larval case of this moth called Psyche Castor. And here we have the female moth, which has just emerged. She has no wings. The male flies in and mates, and then she lays her eggs within that case. OK, so um, what I want to talk about is this moth, Acanthus Psyche atra. Now, I've never seen it. It's a heathland species, which Phil Sterling has found and managed to rear. And I'm using his slides, so thank you to Phil for them. So this is the male moth, looks like a normal moth. And this is the case from which it's just emerged. OK, and this is the case of the female moth here. This is the female moth partially hanging out of the case. So when the caterpillar pupates, some of them pupate with the head at this end and some with the head at this end. If the head is at this end, the male comes in and mates with the other end of the female here. And she's entombed, really. She remains in that case for the rest of her life. But if the caterpillar pupated head down, the male's got this very extensile abdomen, which manages to get in the case right round here to mate with this end of the female. The female can just undergo these peristaltic movements and wriggles out of the case. And here is the female wriggling out of the case. And there she is. She's fallen out and she's on the peaty floor, dark peaty floor of typical heathland habitat. So that's the female moth. It has no wings, no legs, no antennae and no scales. It looks very maggot-like, really quite conspicuous there. It's almost as if it wants to be eaten. Well, in fact, in the 1950s, somebody fed a number of these females to a captive robin. And lo and behold, in due course, a number of Acanthopsychiatra caterpillars emerged from the robin's droppings. So it may be that it does want to be eaten, and it may be that that's its dispersal mechanism, because after all, otherwise it can only disperse as a caterpillar, which can't move very far because it's carrying this burdensome case around with it. Survival clearly wasn't very great in the robin's gut, but it may just be that in the gut of a lizard, it would be rather better. We just don't know. But a fascinating tale and more to be discovered about it, I should think. So thank you for listening. And that's the end of the talk. I'm going to uh, stop the screen sharing now. Wow, well, Barry, thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, there's lots of questions in the chat. As always, I'm going to allow those that would like to bump the queue to put their hand up and ask in person because we like to have people engaging with the speaker. 
Uh, while we're waiting to do that, uh, Chad, do you want to turn your video on and unmute? Hello. Have we got any questions in the chat for Barry? Yeah, there's around seven of them. Um, the first one is, do you think there are any UK species that we are unaware of due to exceptional crypsis? Oh, gosh, that's a difficult one. Well, of course, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I suppose that the greater the crypsis, the harder these things are to find. So that, that could contribute. But I think not, not only are some things cryptic, they're just jolly good at hiding themselves away as well. I'd be surprised if there was a significantly sized moth that we hadn't found because of crypsis. But um, yeah, I mean, yeah, clearly the more cryptic they are, the harder they are to find. And I think in this country, they're pretty well studied. But uh, I would say if you went to a country where the moths are less well studied, yes. I mean, crypsis could be a factor in, in the fact that some species are yet to be discovered. I think I think that's fascinating with Lepidoptera as well is we've got to discover them twice, haven't we? We've got to discover the adult stage and the and the larval stage as well, the caterpillar stage. Yes, Brilliant. absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, Chad, have we got another one from the chat? Yeah. Um, do we know how Lepidoptera um, changed over a million years regarding size, colour, etc.? And what would have been their main predators then? Oh gosh, I think you're going to be taxing me now. Um, <laughs> I mean, the moths have been around about 200 million years. And I mean, in, you know, initially what we've got is fossils of leaf mines, really, because the leaves um, with the mines have fossilized reasonably well. But um, I suppose the Dinosaurs disappeared, what, 65 million years ago, and uh, I'm not quite sure when the, the, when the birds came from the dinosaurs, didn't they? So I suppose the, the birds probably evolved much more recently than the moths. Uh, so I suppose early on it was probably, um, reptiles were probably their main predators, I would guess. But I mean, in terms of what they, what the moths looked like millions of years ago, I, I don't think we really know. I mean, you know, so, some families are, are certainly much older than others in their evolution. But uh, yeah. Uh, David, do you want to unmute and ask your question? No, you, no, you will let me. Um, yeah, I, mean, I stuck this in the chat, but something I've sort of thought when out looking for leaf mines is quite a lot of the, the blotch leaf mines look very bird dropping like to me. Is that known to be an evolved thing or am I just making stuff up in my head? Well, the thing is, we can say what we like, really. We've just got, but we've got to produce a sort of coherent argument uh, to support it, really. So, I've never thought of the mines themselves as looking like bird droppings. Um, I mean, they, they may coincidentally be. I mean, I, I think, you know, it's one of the things in nature, there's so many different forms that some things may coincidentally look like others without there being any particular ev evolutionary convergence to create that impression. But so I'd be surprised if a leaf mine was actually um, gaining, uh, you know, had evolved for that defense. But some of the, you know, the, the, the um, family of moths, the micro moths, the coleophoridae, which all make cases. Uh, so caterpillar carries around a case and most of them mine leaves by um, making a little hole in one surface and then sticking the front end of the lava between the leaf surfaces and mine in that way. But um, in some of those have cases which are clearly bird dropping mimics. Thanks. Uh, Chad, I think we've got time for one more question from the chat. Yeah, one more. Okay. Make, it, make it a good one and make it an answerable one. <laughs> okay, um, I'm just evaluating them quickly. Um, 
I'm going to go with this one. Um, hi, Barry. Do we know if caterpillars can take on any materials from their food, from their food plant to help disguise themselves? Or are they able to change their skin colour to match by any other means? So the question really is, as I understand it, do they take um, coloration, is this, from the leaves to to help their appearance? Yeah, I think they're asking if they um, take aspects of the food as part of their um, camouflage or if they take it from their environment directly. Well, I mean, in terms of the, their pattern, I, I mean, I think it's just probably synthesized by the larva itself. Uh, I can't, I mean, you know, so, some have a fairly sort of transparent skin in many ways. And so, um, you know, the eating a green leaf, some of the uh, green material that was with, within the gut of the larva would be sort of visible, I think. But I mean, they certainly take toxins from their plants means that they can man some of them can manufacture their own toxins, but they're certainly taking toxins from, from um, plants. But in terms of uh, substances that actually used for the colour, I'm otherwise I'm, I, I wouldn't know, but I suspect they just simply manufacture the colours. Right, well, brilliant. Right, well, thank you. Thank you very much for what's been a uh, a great talk, Barry. I'm going to stop the recording now.